Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordian Glory video. In today's episode, we will be doing another Tale of a Tournament Gamer, the series where I tell you about some of the absolutely crazy experiences I have had whilst playing Warhammer 40k at a competitive level. And when I say crazy, I do mean truly insane. Sometimes I think it's both a blessing and a curse that I have been fortunate enough to encounter some of the more unique people and personalities within our hobby. On the one hand, it does make for a great story, but on the other, none of these incidents were particularly pleasant and you all do get to have a good opportunity to laugh at my expense but for example in one of our first tales of a tournament player i told you about the time when a chap called bill the bastard threatened to shoot me with a crossbow because of a game of 40k i promise you i'm not exaggerating and if you want to hear that story for yourself check out the episode that I'm going to link at the end of this one. But what about today? What have I got for your viewing and listening pleasure right now? Well, gather round, dear conscript. Come and listen to Grandpa Mordian. And let me tell you a story. A story about one of the most try-hard players that I have ever encountered. Someone who took bitching, moaning, and whining to heights hitherto unseen. This, dear viewers, is the tale of Salty Steve. Our story begins not all that long ago. I know, kind of surprising, many of these tournament tales take place in 8th edition, if not back in 7th edition. But this is a story from 9th edition, a pretty recent event. Now, for those of you that don't know, 9th edition was a pretty competitive affair. In fact, it has been described as the tournament edition of 40k and GW really seemed to have embraced that side of the hobby. They were releasing MetaWatch articles, they partnered with big companies to help them run tournaments and they were even doing things like golden tickets. If someone wins a particular event then GW would pay them to go out to somewhere like LVO and have all their expenses paid and it's like you get to be rewarded for being a really really good competitive player. However, this being Warhammer and this being Games Workshop, the game was not exactly balanced. And in fact, it seemed every month that a new codex would come out and completely wreck the meta, completely destroy the game and constantly throw things into disarray. And no other faction personified this problem more than the Eldar. Oh yeah, that's right. For all of you Greenhorns that are complaining about Eldar in 10th edition, no, that is just their natural state of being. I don't think there has ever been an edition where Eldar haven't been utterly broken. In fact, little side note, if you want to get into 40k competitively and you want to have an army that's always going to be pretty bloody viable, basically just collect Eldar because they're always really, really good. But in 9th edition, it wasn't actually the craft world which were the big problem, although they did have a few tricks up their sleeve. Specifically, what was absolutely wrecking everybody's faces were the Harlequins. That's right, not only were the funny dancing clown people so oppressive that they had to be hit with the nerf bat directly in the gonads multiple times just to bring them down to a reasonable level. And I would argue that it wasn't until the very, very end of 9th edition where they finally got brought down to everyone else's level. But 
GW also had to introduce new fundamental core rules to try and hold back the hordes of Harlequins. Things like Armor of Contempt, which is now a stratagem intent, were sweeping buffs that were given to multiple factions just so that they would have a chance and not have their entire army deleted by fusion pistols in a single turn. For those of you that like hard data and you're not so much into my emotive ramblings, let me give you some numbers to really hammer this home. At one point in 9th edition, Harlequins were so broken that they had an 83% win rate. And that was before you removed the mirror match. Naturally, with the faction being so powerful, they were quickly becoming one of the most popular, with competitive players around the world jumping on the Harlequin bandwagon. And so, of course, Harlequins were the faction that Steve was using when I first encountered him. It was at a small local one day RTT tournament. But don't be fooled, this place was a little bit of a shark tank because they always made sure that their results were registered on BCP and therefore you could earn some pretty tasty ITC points from going to these events. As a result, you tend to find that everyone, even the more local friendly players, were bringing their A game, their best army lists and their most cutthroat factions. That was of course, unless you were me. You guys know that I like my Imperial Guard, regardless of whether they were good or whether they were bad. I'm always going to run the Emperor's true finest, the hammer of the Imperium, the humble bloody guardsman. And let me tell you, dear viewers, at this point in the edition, Guard were not meta. Guard were not good. We were in a really, really bad situation. One of the worst I've ever seen it. Almost as bad as what it was like back in 7th. No word of a lie. At the time of this tale, Guard were rocking a crisp, a fresh, a brisk, 22 to 26% win rate. You had basically no chance of ever winning an event and just going with a positive win rate was a really, really big deal. Most of the time you were going into tournaments and you were expecting to go one and four and if you were lucky, two and three. The main reason for this, why the faction was so far into the toilet, they were past the U-Bend and out to sea, is because we were still running an 8th edition book. Most of the factions at that time, especially major venerable ones that have been around for a long time with big player bases, had received their 9th edition book. But Guard was still rocking an 8th edition codex. And whilst we did have some expansions such as Psychic Awakening, these had also come out in 8th edition and they were a bit of a help, but honestly, it was like putting a sticking plaster or a band-aid over a gaping wound. But despite all of this, irregardless of the fearsome odds stacked against me, I still ran my guard because I just love the faction. And what I wanted to do was find out if there were some hidden gems, if there were some combos, some crazy janky lists and tactics that might just allow the guard to stay competitive, to stay relevant. Unfortunately, when I first encountered Steve at this tournament, I had only really just begun the process of discovery and exploration, and I had not yet struck gold. Therefore, our first game at this tournament, which I think was round two of the day, 
was a very one-sided affair. I wish I could tell you, dear viewers, that I fought the good fight, that I went down swinging, and that I beat the odds and triumphed against the Wacker player. But I did not. I got my ass thoroughly handed to me. Infantry were mown down, tanks were blown up, artillery was routed, and it was the definition of a massacre. Now, many players, when they're running a very powerful army, and they get matched up against someone who's running probably a bottom tier force, tend to have the social awareness to be a little bit delicate about the situation because they know they've got a good force and you know you've not got a great one, but they don't need to rub it in your face. There's no need to put salt into the wound. But Steve was not magnanimous in victory. He was not gracious or sensitive. His behavior throughout the entire game could be described as gloating. Every move he made, he proudly declared that there was nothing that I could do to stop him. Every time he shot and blew up a tank, he would guffaw and ridicule the paper-thin armor of my Lehman Russes. Every single assault where he swept through a platoon of guardsmen, he would mercilessly chuckle to himself, and throughout the entire battle, he was basically mocking me for turning up with Imperial Guard, making it seem like I was an idiot for not running the top tier faction. But it wasn't just a case of I'm running the good faction, you're running the bad one. It was also like he felt he was some kind of tactical genius. Every move that I would make, he would sort of snigger to himself and say, oh, well, I wouldn't do that. Every time I would shoot a unit, he would go, oh, no, that's not the right move. You should be shooting this one instead. And it was like he thought he was the next Solar Macarius. He thought he was the best general in the room when actually he was just piling Harlequin troops into boats and rushing them across the table, jumping out and killing everyone. It got so bad that at the end of the game, Steve tried to coach me and teach me on what I could have done better. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a very open-minded person. And whenever I do lose a game or I come across someone who is clearly a better and more skilled player than I am, I will often ask them or I will often take the opportunity to learn from someone like that because that way I can become a better player. But this wasn't that. This was Steve being unbelievably condescending and basically his advice consisted of Bro, why are you even playing guard? They're so trash right now. You should be playing Harlequins. That's how you get good. But little did Steve realize I had been learning, watching, and observing throughout the entire game. You see, once I realized how screwed I was, I'd read about how powerful Harlequins were, but you had to see it to believe it. I understood that there was very little point in me playing the game properly. Instead, I took this as an opportunity to stress test certain units on his side and in my own army list. Whilst at the time it might have seemed like a boneheaded maneuver to put that Lehman Rust demolisher out in the open, it meant that I now had a much clearer idea of how many fusion pistols it would take to destroy one. Whilst it might have seemed crazy for me to charge my infantry into the Harlequin troop, I never would have learned that they could fight on death if I hadn't done so. And so with this new data gathered, I was able to improve and enhance my list. And I knew that I was likely to face off against Eldar and Harlequins again, and therefore, tailoring my list, gearing it towards handling the top dog, was a way to overall make my army much better. Simply put, I was willing to sacrifice my entire army if it meant I could learn more about my enemy. I was willing to lose a battle if it meant I could win the war.
But there's only so much you can learn from one battle and drawing too many conclusions from a single encounter can skew you in one direction. I needed more data. I needed to find out what else these Harlequins were capable of. And so I needed to play against them again. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be long before I got my chance. And thus, a month later, I went back to that shop and took part in their next monthly regular RTT. And once again, as fate would have it, no word of a lie, I encountered Steve. And again, it was in round two. I was running guard. He was running Harlequins. The stage was set for a rematch. But this time, it wouldn't be such a one-sided affair. This time, things would be different. Because whereas Steve had brought an almost identical list to last time, oh, and a small side note here, the way this guy painted and transported his models made me cry every time. Harlequin models and Eldar models are all pretty detailed. They've often got little bits sticking off them. They're quite fragile, they're quite dainty, and especially the Harlequin ones, they've often got little flowing bits coming off them because they're meant to look like they're dancing through the air. Now, he had just done a minimum three color paint job on these guys. Fair enough, not everyone is into painting, but Harlequin models can look truly gorgeous when given the attention that they deserve. I could have forgiven the bad paint job though. Like I said, not everyone's a hobbyist. But getting your entire army and without any padding and just dumping them inside a large see-through plastic Chinese takeaway container is just unforgivable. This guy literally used to take his Harlequin boats and just shove them on top of his infantry that had died and then get the container lid and squash his army down. And you could hear like the models creaking and chipping and breaking. It was just weird. And every single time that I saw this army, it was a little bit more destroyed. There was another cape that had been cracked off, another sword that had been broken. And you just had this gathering pile of broken bits at the bottom of this container. But I digress. Getting back to the main story, Steve was using an almost identical list and I was running a very different army. I had brought a tank company. There were 10 Lehman Russes, that was my entire army, and all of them were equipped with extra sponsons and stubbers and storm bolters. I'd really dialed them up to the nines, so every single vehicle was an individual battle brick. It was like a rolling fortress going across the map. But this wasn't just a display of pure brute force. I'd been kind of clever and tactical with the different options I'd given my tanks. So my more long range ones, like my executioners and my battle tanks, I had given las cannons, heavy bolter, plasma cannon sponsors. And my shorter range vehicles, like my four Lehman Rust demolishers, were all rocking triple heavy flamer. The reasoning behind this was my fire support Russes could reach out and dacker any target across the board, but my bruiser tanks, my demolishers, could drive forward, start blasting, and if the enemy tried to tie them up and lock them up in combat with things like spare Harlequin boats, it wouldn't help them because I could just burn my way out with the flamers and the storm bolters. And you know what? It very nearly almost worked. At first, Steve was his usual guffawing, condescending, arrogant self. Once he saw the 10 Russes go down, he did hesitate for a moment, but quickly recovered his composure and began laughing literally in my face at what a silly list I had brought. But as the game went on, and the battle was increasingly difficult, Steve's attitude changed markedly. Rather than one of sure arrogance, it became a desperate, sweaty battle. And there were 
Some angry comments made, some jibes thrown across my way. Oh, stupid janky list. Shouldn't be allowed to get something like this on the table. Goes against 40k. Things should be balanced. Hearing those words come out of that particular mouth when using a certain army really was the height of irony. But that was lost on Steve. The thing is, the game was a huge struggle for him because... Whilst he was dancing around and trying to do objectives, I was just killing stuff. And it's all well and good having fusion pistols, but against a Russ, they only wound on a 4+. plus. Sometimes you make the 4 pluses, sometimes you don't. But when you're facing off against so many Lehman Russes, you really need those 4 plus fusion pistol wounds to come up every single time. And when they don't, you've basically just sacrificed the unit for nothing. Sadly, despite my best efforts, the Harlequins were able to pull off a fairly convincing win, having about a 20-point lead over my tanks by the end of the game. Steve quickly regained his composure and went from salty boy back to his natural state of arrogant and insufferable prick, loudly guffawing and proclaiming his victory over the feeble guard once more. But there was no denying the flop sweat upon his brow, and there was no denying the relieved tremor in his voice once the game was over. And no wonder. Because once the dust had settled, I still had 6 out of 10 Russes. I'd only taken 40% casualties, something unheard of in the guard, especially when I'm in command. And the Harlequins had a couple of very damaged skimmers and a handful of shattered infantry squads. Whilst the points might have indicated a victory... The guard had been in a dominant position throughout the entire game. And it was them that had given the Harlequins a bloody nose. And it was not a massacre this time. Things were going in the right direction. And once again, I had learned some valuable lessons. And thusly, post-tournament, once more, I returned to my Fortress of Solitude. To my Mind Palace. And I began cooking up version three of the anti-meta list. The final iteration of the Harlequin Destroyer 9000. I had learned that they struggled to deal with mass armor. I had learned that any kind of negative to hit modifier really screwed over those fusion pistols. But what had cost me the game was a lack of indirect fire... I was unable to target small units they'd hidden on objectives and also a lack of objective control myself. I needed some troops to help secure primary points on the map. And after two whole months of plotting and scheming and planning and trial and error, I finally got the chance to put everything into practice. It was time to go in for one more round. This would be the third and final time I would play against Steve and where he would earn the moniker of Salty. It happened at Element Games, one of my favorite venerable gaming establishments. I've attended many tournaments there and it was a particularly hot weekend. Everyone was sweating balls, but... I was cool, calm, and collected because round five, the last round of a two-day Team GT, I got paired up against Steve. Now, how team tournaments work is a little bit different. Rather than people just getting paired up against each other automatically via something like Best Coast Pairing, via an app, Instead, the two teams get paired up against each other and then each captain goes through an elaborate process of deciding which players they want to play against the opposing team members. There's all sorts of names on cards and some get placed face down, some get placed face up. It doesn't really matter. The main takeaway from this is as a player, you actually have quite a high degree of control 
over who on the opposing team you are matched up against. And the moment that I found out that in round five, we would be playing Steve's team, I turned to my team captain, Stu, and said, I want to play against Steve. Now, this took him aback because no one wanted to play Steve. The guy's got a reputation. Multiple people on our team had said to Stu, if I get paired into Steve, I'm just going to refuse to play him. I'm going to insist on a repairing. I don't care if it's really, really awkward. So me turning around and going, I'll play him. I want to play him. Make sure I pair up against him was a big shock, but also a huge relief for the captain. It was one less thing for him to have to worry about. But if Stu's reaction had been a bit funny, then Steve's reaction was absolutely priceless. I think mostly he was just shocked that anyone had actually requested to play against him. And when he found out that it was the guard guy who he had absolutely stomped in two previous encounters, his face was a mixture of shock, disbelief, trepidation, but finally, that smug grin returned across those features. After all, we had danced this dance before and he'd always come out on top. Surely, he would win once more. Surely, it would be another easy victory for the world's best player. Oh, Steve, you sweet, stupid, naive child. Don't you know who I am? I'm your nightmare. I'm your nemesis. I am Goldaheel, the butcher of Galatep. No, wait, that's Deep Space Nine. Oh, Steve, don't you realize the pain train I've got in store for you? You see, my list was pure tanks. But this time, I had a mixture of chimeras full of infantry, backed up by self-propelled guns and multiple Lehman Rust Demolisher main battle tanks. Every single vehicle was festooned with heavy flamers. Each Lehman Rust had three of the things and a Storm Bolter on top. Each chimera had two heavy flamers and a Storm Bolter on top. Each of my artillery pieces, the basilisks, the medusa, were also rocking heavy flamers. It did not matter what Steve tried to do. If he tried to get close to me, I would flame him. If he tried to time me up in combat, I would flame him. Even the infantry squads inside of the chimeras were rocking flamers and heavy bolters so that once they got out, I could still overwatch him. On top of this, the Guard Tank Corps had received multiple buffs, either via supplements such as the Warzone Octarius Rising Tide Cajun Supplement, or FAQs and Aratas, which had increased the Lehman Russ's save to a 2+, and had given it Armor of Contempt, along with our other vehicles as well. Combining all of this together, it meant that when I got the first turn, I went all gas, no brakes. All of my chimeras roared forwards. All of my Russes pushed forward, and I was very aggressive and took ground. In previous games, I'd allowed myself to get boxed in because I had guns that didn't want to get tied up in combat because if they did, they wouldn't be able to shoot or they'd shoot a lot less effectively. But this time, not only was I more durable so I could be more aggressive and take more risks, but also everyone had flamers. So the more that Steve tried to tie up, the more he would get burninated. In fact, one of the tricks he'd done in my previous games would use like one boat to tag like two Russes or a couple of other vehicles. Now, if he did that, all he was doing was increasing the chances of me just burning that vehicle to death and just getting rid of it. But wait, there's more! Because every single one of my Chimeras was equipped with smoke launchers. And because we were still using the 8th edition book, it meant it wasn't a stratagem for the guard to pop smoke. Every single tank could do it in the game in the same turn if I wanted to, but it was only once per tank. That was kind of the trade-off you had in the old smoke launchers. So what happened was all my chimeras drive forward, they all pop smoke and the Russes move up behind them a respectful distance, waiting for the Harlequins to take the bait. And I just start bombarding him with three or four artillery pieces. So he knows he can't hide. His Harlequins in response come boiling out 
and they start firing off all these fusion pistols against my chimeras and they just miss with most of them because harlequins only hit on threes so if i'm able to get them down to fours then it's like they're shooting against leaving rusted rather than hitting on threes and winning on fours they're hitting on fours and winning on threes and i'd already learned my lesson that you make a one-shot weapon hit on a four plus when you need it to get that hit often it's going to fail that 50 50. this was a proper battle both sides were evenly matched it was guard armor versus eldar skimmers there was move and counter move play and counter move push and counter push and it could have been one of the greatest and most fun and satisfying experiences of both of our Warhammer careers. But unfortunately, I was playing against Steve. And when things aren't a cakewalk for him, he gets salty. The amount of bitching and moaning and whining that this guy did was unprecedented. Every single time I would move a unit, he'd huff and puff and complain and ask me to measure and remeasure to make sure I wasn't going too far. Often I was moving less than my maximum distance because I was just going far enough to get the angle that I needed to start flaming him. Every single time I would roll my dice, if they were even slightly above average, he would start chucking his toys out of the pram, berating me, insulting me. Oh, that's bullshit. That's so unfair. And every single time that his dice went badly, he would literally pick them up and throw them across the room. Like, I'm not using you anymore. He'd throw them across the room. I'm not using that dice anymore. It was wild. But when his tantrum tactics didn't work, he switched to a new approach. He started whining and wheedling and getting all upset and sad and being like, oh, it's really unfair. Oh, woe is me. Oh, why can't I catch a break? Bear in mind, he's still using one of the most powerful armies in the game right now. And there was one turn when my dice were a little hot. I'm not going to deny it. I'd roll the number of shots from a twin heavy flamer and I'd get a five and a six. I'd roll the number of shots from my next heavy flamer, I'd get a six and a four. I'd roll the shots from my next chimera, I'd get double six. And after the fourth or fifth time this happened, Steve was literally sat with his head in his hands, tears streaming down his face, his shoulders shaking as he tries fruitlessly to stop himself from sobbing openly. And when his team captain comes up to him and goes, Steve, are you right, mate? What's going on? And he just looks up with the snot bubbling out of his nose and says, he just won't stop rolling sixes. That was really the peak Steve moment for me in the game. However, in spite of the clear guard domination, in spite of the fact that I had maintained control and initiative throughout the entire game, the score was pretty close. This is because Eldar are a very fast faction and Harlequins are even more so. And this means that they're always able to score some points every round. I had managed to keep a small lead over them the entire game. And at the end of my turn five, I was about... 20 points ahead, which is not too bad at all. But the Harlequins got their turn five. And even though they only had one transport boat, one character, and three models left from one of their infantry squads, one of their troops, between their secondaries and their primary scoring shenanigans, because they scored primary at the end of of the turn rather than the beginning because they had gone second they were able to score 24 points in their final turn i'm sorry guys i wish i could tell you this was hollywood i wish i could tell you there was a fairy tale ending and i wish i could say that i had finally managed to beat steve but this is the real world this is reality and he did win the third game. 
But it was very much a Pyrrhic victory. Because rather than being loud and proud and arrogant and boastful like he normally was, when I looked across the table, all I saw was a broken man. He looked exhausted. His eyes were sunken back into his head. His arms hung slackly by his side and he looked weary and tired to his bones. And in a surprise move, he reached out, offered his hand, and we shook. And he said in a small, begrudging voice, good game. And if there's any justice that you want to find from this story, Steve never ran his Harlequins again. He never used them at the tournament. He decided that after our game, they were no longer broken and overpowered. I mean, they barely even managed to beat guard. And the next time that I saw Steve at a tournament, he was running 9th edition leagues of Votan. Gentlemen, as far as I am concerned, I may not have been able to win the battles, but I was able to win the war. After all the dice had been rolled, after all the blood had been spilt, the Harlequins were driven back into the webway from whence they came. And it was his Imperial Guard that stood firm. It was his true finest that was still holding the line. And that, my dear viewers, is the tale of Salty Steve, the most quintessential winner all costs competitive player. If the faction that he had couldn't walk over everyone with ease, he just moved on to another one. I hope you've all enjoyed today's video. If you have, don't forget to smash that like button. And if you want to hear more of these Tales of a Tournament Gamer episodes, then please make sure that you subscribe and click the bell icon. But before we go, I have just one last question to ask you. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and Patreons. You guys are amazing. Truly the lifeblood of the channel. I could not do Mordian Glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members. So thank you guys so much. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Bon Bon Vert, Ken Starr, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Varney. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. You are incredible. Your generosity is truly humbling. And I could just say it a thousand times over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.